Yeah, so Jesus, we just thank you so much for what you did on that day, on that, on that hill. You know, this week I was actually going to preach on the power of the cross, but the Lord diverted me, so that's for next week. Whew. But all week I've just been thinking about just the power of what Jesus did for us. Just dying on that cross, like... We did not deserve it. So that's just been on my mind. I was just researching how he just gave his life for us and like what happened through that. So I can't wait to share that message with you next week or the week after. It depends if Pep is preaching. But today, guys, I, my, before I even give you my sermon title, I want to start by asking you these questions. Has anyone felt sad? I have. Uh, has anyone felt like they had no purpose? I have. Well, today's sermon title is Get Up and Don't Give Up. So get up and don't give up. And I want to start and read to you 1 Kings 19. So if you have your Bibles, turn to it. And we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read all the way to uh, verse 18. Hey, Dad, can you turn off the uh, AC real quick? Sorry, guys, it's a little cold in here. All right, so verse 1 says, When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, May the gods strike me and even kill me, if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judea, in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down on a, a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around there beside him. Beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or your, the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to the king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimishi, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elijah, son of, uh, sorry, son of Saphet, from the town of Abel Mahoya, sorry, I'm bad at the names, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes will be killed. There it is. So something really popped out to me as I was reading this. When Elijah felt alone, defeated, and felt like giving up, God meets him in the moment of despair, not with rebuke, but with understanding, comfort, sustenance, and a renewed purpose. We saw that. He, what happened was he comes and he's, he's telling God what is bothering him, and God, God does all these amazing things in front of him and then says, here's your new purpose. He gave him a new one. We saw that at the end. So what I saw here and what the Lord's been really unpacking to me this week is for someone on the other side of the screen. And, for, and, and, and it really, I feel the Lord saying, get up and don't give up. Because 
right now you're either letting fear win or doubt win. Something is going on inside of you that the Lord sees, and this message is for you. So the first thing that I want to say is don't let fear run you away from your purpose. This could be fear of rejection, fear of being laughed at, fear of getting hurt like in Elisha's case, or ultimately fear of failure. All of these things I encounter on a daily basis, but I choose what I do with it. Um, I heard Chris Valadin say, fear is faith in the wrong God. You know, there's healthy fear. There's fear of the Lord. That's having reverence of who he is, the Lord Almighty, the God of, the, of heaven. But with that fear of the Lord is not anxiety or anxiousness or I'm scared or he's going to strike me with a lightning bolt because how many know there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus? So let's look at, let's look at this right now. The next thing that we see here is God provides everything you need for the journey. So typ typically when I'm afraid of something that I'm stepping into and I'm, I'm running away from it and I'm running away from my purpose, one of the fears that maybe you have today is I don't have the provision for it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I don't have the resources. I don't have the people. But I just want to say this to you. God provides everything you need for the journey. We saw this right, right here when he sent a minister, an angel, um, he, he, the angel even clearly said, right, in verse 4, we read it. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. But let's, let's check it out. Sorry, I got lost here. He looked around, and there beside his head was some ba bread baked on hot stones and jar water. But get, catch this. Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead of you will be too much for you. So the Lord obviously, like, sent this angel and sent him the right amount he needed to get to the spot where God was going to give him his new purpose. Well, I just want to say to you, God is going to give you exactly what you need to complete the purpose that he set out for you. Now, Elijah didn't know this, but God was providing for him in his weakness. God was giving him everything that he needed to be to the place where he learned this new purpose. But someone today feels like this prophet. You feel like giving up. You've prayed the same prayer that Elijah prayed, asking God to take your life. But I just want to say this to you today. If you are breathing, God still has a plan for your life. Get up and eat. So I want to turn in our Bibles to Matthew 6. Is this good? Matthew 6, verse 31, we'll start in. It says this, So don't worry about these things saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So, so right now, what you're going through, when maybe, maybe you've actually stepped into this purpose God has called you to, and you're like me. Sometimes you're worried about the provision. Well, I just want to say that God has everything you need to get through this. Seek him. Seek him. Seek his kingdom. Seek his thoughts. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. His knowledge, his understanding of everything. You see, God knows all time and all space. He created it all. So he has all the answers. And you have an opportunity to speak to him, and we'll get to that. So in the darkness, Jesus is the only light. We need to learn to depend on him in this season, in this season of feeling like giving up. You need to learn to depend on him. Like I said in my sermon last week, and we just celebrated Independence Day. You know, I just want to say this. America is not an independent country. It is a country that 100%, if we want it to last, needs to be dependent upon God. Our country needs to be dependent upon God. There are so many people today trying to separate church and state. It cannot happen. It cannot happen. We will fall. But also in our lives, we are not independent. We are dependent upon a king, and his name is Jesus. 
So how did I get out of my depression? Maybe you all don't know that. I suffered with severe depression and anxiety my whole life. I've struggled with it. But I've gotten out of it. I don't, I don't suffer the way I suffered. I don't cry the way I used to cry. I don't weep the way I used to weep. How did I do this? Well, first, I placed my faith in Jesus, and I found a new hope. A lot of the times, what led to my sadness was not having hope. I would always say, there's no hope for my life. My life is useless. I have no purpose. I have no destiny. I'm just a waste of breath. Maybe you've said these same things. So I want to encourage you and tell you this, that there is a hope in Jesus Christ found only in him, an eternal hope. Second thing I learned is I learned to recognize what I had rather than looking at what I didn't have. I read my Bible to learn what God thought about me. Now, when I learned what he thought about me, I was his beloved, and I'm seen by him, and I'm treasured, and I'm God's masterpiece, all these things. When I learned those things, I started to realize that if the God of the universe cares about me, why can't I care about me? So I began to meditate on what he thought about me, and this is the next step. We have to realize that our words have power. I learned to change my way of thinking and learned that there is a power in our words. And instead of saying I'm depressed, I said I'm full of joy. And here are some biblical I am statements that you can try. First, I'm adopted. I am a child of God. Write that down. Second, I'm his beloved. Third, I'm seen by God. Fourth, I am treasured. Fifth, I am God's masterpiece. And sixth, I am no longer a slave to fear. You are no longer a slave to this fear, friend. Christ has freed you from, like we are singing, from the sting of death. So what do we need to do? Like I was talking about, we need to learn to hear his voice. Now, I just want to say this. Hearing from God is not a specific, like, I am anointed, so I get to hear from the Lord. I am set apart from you other believers. That's not the case anymore. That's an Old Testament anointing. We all, when we accept Jesus Christ, we get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You're anointed. You get to hear from God now. You have access to speak to the king of the universe. And not just speak to him, you get an opportunity to hear from him. He talks back. So I had to first, like, even looking at that, I had to understand, like, well, is this true? Is this biblical? Guess what? Let's turn to John 10, verse 27. It says, my sheep, what? Hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. This indicates that we are all sheep of the shepherd, correct? We can hear the shepherd's voice. And I'm willing to say this, that if you can't hear him, you need to. You need to step out. You need to learn to hear his voice. So let's, let's look over, maybe I can give you some steps on how to learn this, but friend, you have to ask God and you have to learn to listen because like in Elijah's case, sometimes he speaks in a still whisper. But this is how I learned. Step one, I learned to quiet my mind. Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. So be still and know that I am God. Sometimes that's hard. Maybe you're like me. I struggle with like super bad anxiety and I'll be shaking and all this stuff. And, but guess what, friend? You have to learn to be still in the presence of God and trust that he knows what's best for you. Know that he is God, the great I am. So sit still. Ask him this. Now, the next thing is, and this is crucial for every Christian, you know, in my, in my time in working different churches, I, I've noticed that there's some people that truly believe they don't need to read scripture. Why? This is the word of God. It's a living book. We'll get to that later. It's alive. It, it speaks to us. We need to be immersing ourselves in scripture. You know, I've had people, I've had people tell me and, and tell my friends, like, these, these words right here. Uh, Why do I need to read the Bible? Again, I've already read it all the way through one time. No, 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 no. Every time I read this thing, I get a new interpretation of it by the Holy Spirit. He begins to speak to me. The Holy Spirit teaches us through his word. And get this, if you're hearing from God and it's contradictory to this, chances are it's not from God. 
Actually, it isn't from God. The Holy Spirit will not contradict his word. So we need to be immersing ourselves in scripture. This cultivates spiritual discernment. So we get to discern what, what is... Sorry about that. To discern what is biblical. Yes, thank you, Jesus. So by studying and meditating on the word of God, this allows us to develop an intimate understanding of God. All throughout scripture, you learn about who God is, his, cult, his, his, um, his nature, that he's a God of love and he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so we can have everlasting life. We learn that he loves the world. He loves you. And he's given you an option out of this wickedness, out of death. He's paid the price. So we get to learn about him in this. And if you don't read this, you don't get to understand the full grasp of who he is. Because how many know sometimes you can't understand someone if you don't know their character? If you can't have an intimate relationship with someone if you don't truly know them. If you don't truly get to know who they are. If you don't learn how they speak. Now, I want you to remember this verse, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is alive. Guys, the Bible, like I said, is a living book. Catch this. This is Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So this book is alive. These words are alive. But how many know that this is just a, the, uh, just a bunch of paper and ink without the power of the Holy Spirit? There's people that will read this and just throw it aside. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. He convicts us through his word. Now, the next step that, that I did to learn to speak to the Lord and to hear his voice is I learned to pray and talk to him, but I also tried journaling. This is something that I want to encourage everyone in Novus to try. Before I read my word, guys, I ask the Lord this question. God, what do you have for me to learn today? What are you saying to me? What do I need to change? And how am I messing up? These are things I ask him. What, and, then, and then I go deeper, but then the Holy Spirit begins to answer these. And after reading, I ask Holy Spirit what he wants me to learn in this. And, and then he, and like, like, it's kind of like a filtration system. I get down to it and then I get the point and then I begin to write. He gives me, and I write it down and then I go back to it. And I look at it, how I'm growing. And I'm learning to hear his voice through his word. Now the next thing I want to encourage you guys is run forward, run to him, and run with him. Moving on from learning to hear his voice. Hopefully that helps you. Um, Hebrews 12 one says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. So God has paved the road, but it's up to you to follow him. I want to talk to you about NASCAR. How many love NASCAR? I don't know anything about NASCAR, but I know this, that there is a pacer car in NASCAR. There is a car that goes in front of all the cars. And catch this, a pacer car, both in NASCAR and IndyCar, has two functions. It leads the field through sev several warm-up laps prior to the start of the race, and it also heads to the front of the field during caution periods to reduce the speed of the cars on the track. Cars are not allowed to pass during caution periods. So when I was looking at this, the Holy Spirit began to show me that, guys, we, when we follow God, he'll guide us through caution periods in our life. He'll guide us through the obstacles. And this doesn't mean you're not going to face challenges. But when you follow the Lord, when you follow the lead car, he will guide you through it. Because he set this path. He knows what's ahead. Follow his lead. But we must allow him to be in front of our lives. And like I said last week, we cannot put Jesus in the trunk. He must drive the car. He needs to be in the front. He needs to be leading our lives. We cannot say, Jesus, get in the trunk. And then whenever something happens, we want to pull him out of the trunk and say, go after this. No, we cannot do that. He needs to lead our lives. He needs to be in the front. We need to follow him through caution periods, through trials, through situations. Because he's the only way out of it. Now get this, we must allow him to be in the front of our lives because he knows what's safe and what is dangerous in this race that you are running because he's marked it out for you. So, but when we move away, when we move away from the following the Lord, when we step away from the path that he has for us, 
when we stop following his guide is when we enter a period of danger. We're vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. You got to get back with God. When he steps, you step. That's how I want to live my life. When God steps, I want to step because guess what? He knows what's safe. Have any of you seen, um, what is that? There's a, there's a show where they, they put all these people in a bunch of challenges, but, and, and when you step, one of the glass may fall through. Well, guys, how many know that Jesus knows which glass is safe to step on? So step where he steps, follow his lead. Now, I just want to say this to you. Even when we don't see it, he is working. How many have heard the song? Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Guys, this is so true. He never stops working. I want to talk to you about corn today. <laughs> Guys, I know these are weird sermon illustrations, but we're going to talk about corn. Did you know that farmers spend up to $50,000 on seed hoping for something to come? Something can happen, and it, it could not grow. Corn typically requires from 100 to 120 growing degree days to emerge under warm soil conditions, under good soil conditions. The calendar time from planting to emerge can be as little as four days under cold soil conditions, Emergence can take as long as four weeks. So guys, do you know what's going on here? Under the ground, there is a root system that's developing that's so deep before it even emerges. And that was such a testimony, uh, testimony about God to me. And it's so cool how we can see him in his creation that even when we don't see it, God is growing the roots in your life for something to emerge. You may be thinking, God, why isn't this happening? God, why isn't this happening? But friend, it just hasn't sprouted yet. These farmers are waiting around, waiting for the crops to burst out of the ground. And they know that underground, there's a root system being developed that would allow them to grow high. Now, we may not see something in front of us all the time. We may not see it emerging out of the ground yet, friend. But God is working on the roots, and they are growing. Now, I want to leave you with this. He never stops working. Like I said, John 5, 5, 17 says, But Jesus replied, My Father is always working, and so am I. Second thing is, He is keeping watch. He doesn't sleep on you. How many people have someone sleep on them? Don't follow through with what they've committed. God follows through with His promises. He's a promise keeper. They don't sleep on you, and he is always awake to talk to you. He's always there. Psalms 12, or 121 verse 4 says, Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The next thing is he never grows weak, and he has all the answers. He knows what's best. For you. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, Have you never heard, have you never understood, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. Give him praise for that, because that is incredible. The Lord is the everlasting God. He is the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. Guys, this God we have, this creator, this Lord we have, the Lord of our life, never grows weak like me and you. He never grows weary. Now, this doesn't mean he doesn't know that, what that feels like. Because remember, Jesus came to earth and experienced everything that you are experiencing. So he, he did that so that he can know what it feels like to be in your shoes. He knows that. So you can talk to him about it because he knows what it's like to struggle with that anxiety. Jesus, right before he went to the cross, was so, so much anxiety there, to the point where he is bleeding out of his pores. He is sweating blood. He knows 
I've never been so nervous, never, never so nervous about something to the point where I sweat blood. So Jesus knows the extreme. I promise you he knows the mild as well. Now before we pray, I want to give you guys a dream I had which led to this sermon. You know, in the dream there was a house, and I, I wrote this down. There was a house, and me and Mariana were actually looking at the house, and an old lady comes up to me, and she is the owner of this house. And we're sitting down in this chair after she says, have a seat, and we're sitting down, and I'm talking to her about life. And I asked her, are you a Christian? Because, like, she was giving me this, like, vibe of, like, she doesn't like Jesus. So I asked her, are you a Christian? She said to me, no, I hate God. He destroyed my life. The next thing I know, she's telling me about her son and her brother, all of this stuff with her house and why she's selling it because they left her. And I, and I told her that I am a Christian. And the next thing I know, I felt a deep earning, yearning in my spirit. I felt the Holy Spirit, not only in my dream, but I felt it in the physical where I was in my bed. I felt the Holy Spirit say this, tell her you left me thinking that I gave up on you and stopped working, but I never did. I never gave up. I never stopped working. You just became so distracted and hurt by the loss that you stopped recognizing all of the things that I've done for you. I'm going to say that again. I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, to tell her, you left me thinking that I gave up on you. I never gave up. He never gave up on you. And stopped working, but I never did. He never left you. He's never left you. He is with you in this. They may have left you, but he has never left you. I never stopped working you just became so distracted. How many people have been so distracted by the hurt and the loss that you stopped recognizing all of the things to be grateful for from God? I have. There is always something to be grateful for. The only reason why you have breath right now is because God gave you the yes to breathe. And behind that breath, like I said, there you still have a purpose. He has a plan for your life. Take the step, get up, take the step, and don't give up. So Jesus, I just ask that this word is a seed that plants on their heart and begins to grow. That whatever they're facing, Anybody today who feels like giving up, who feels like there's no hope, would come to know you and know this truth that you never left them. God, I just bless them. I, I just ask that you just, you just, I actually see God right now, and I see this all the time. I, I see this all the time where Jesus just takes you by the hand, and he's walking with you through this. And he's saying, follow me, son. I know the safe way. Follow me, daughter. I know the safe way through this. I'll supply everything you need to get through it. Don't worry about that. I'm a good father. So Jesus, we thank you that you're a good dad, that you take care of your kids. You're a good shepherd. You speak. <laughs> you're a good shepherd. Your sheep know your voice. God, we thank you that we get to hear from you and that it's not just some special man with an anointing, but God, you eradicated that and allowed us all to be anointed, us all to do the work of the ministry, us all to hear from the Lord, to proclaim your gospel unto the world. God, we thank you for that. God, we no longer hide under the rock. We no longer rest under the tree and say, take our life. God, we stand up, we get up, and we walk to find our renewed purpose or to walk and continue to walk in what you've called us to. There are no options of giving up. On your time, God, we'll leave this earth. So as long as I still have breath, God, I will serve you. I will walk with you. 
And God, when I get off the path, I thank you that you lead me back to still waters. You'll bring me back onto the path. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, uh, my dad is going to hop on with everybody on the Zoom and go into the room and talk to y'all. I'll be in there in just a second. But I just love you guys so much, and I hope this blesses you. And if you need to talk to someone, um, hit us up on, on uh, Instagram, or just uh, if you just I'll talk to you in a second. But if you're on YouTube, click the link below. It says follow us on Instagram. Go to Instagram. DM me, DM Novus. You'll see my videos. You can find all that stuff. But I would love to connect with you and help you get through this this storm that you're facing right now and to continue to minister truth unto you. So God, I bless them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.